My dad used to rent this house way out in the middle of nowhere, a good 45 minutes from any town. The closest neighbor was another 15 minutes away. On this property were several enclosures for raising pheasants. These belonged to the property owner, so my dad had no responsibility towards them other than to notify the owner if he saw anything wrong. He was high school buddies with the owner, so they were on good terms. Well, one morning, he notices something very wrong in the pheasant enclosure furthest from the house with a good 50 or so birds. Every single one of them had been slaughtered overnight. What was even weirder was that it didn't seem to be an act of predation. None of the birds seemed to have been consumed. Luckily, the owner had cameras, and they got to see what really happened. So, sometime in the middle of the night, a man, neither one of them recognized, had wandered onto the property. He made no attempt to approach the house, but instead crawled under the enclosure's fence and proceeded to catch and stab each pheasant with a knife while wearing a headlamp. They caught the entire event on camera, from him entering the property till he left early in the morning. The police were called out, but nothing ever came of it. My dad was so freaked out from the whole event that he made us stay with our mom for several weeks while he slept in bed with a gun. The property owner tightened up security with new fences and alarms. He even bought some guard dogs. They were very well trained and super friendly to anyone who'd approached them during the day. Nothing ever happened again on that farm and the bird-killing psycho was never found. I live in a really rural town. Not so much a town as more a farm spread over many miles with a town in the middle that consists of a post office, a bar, a gas station, and a general store. I'm not a farmer, though. One of the farms had a big house on it that the farmer renovated into apartments. It's an hour to the nearest city, but that's the way I like it. Also, I work from home, so it suits me well. There's five people in the building, including myself. An old married couple, two older men, and me. All of them are sweet, though, and very nice. Sometimes the wife of the couple comes down and we have coffee or tea. She's like a second mom to me, really. It's probably not too big of a surprise to say that the place has a mouse problem. We live out in the middle of a wheat field, so it's kind of to be expected. The landlord tries to take care of them and also calls in an exterminator once a year, but they still get in every now and then. So when I heard scratching from the ceiling, that was my first thought. It was the mice in the walls again. I really wasn't too concerned with it at first, but it went on for almost the whole day. When I could still notice it the next day, I figured it must be a pretty bad infestation, so I called the landlord and told him about it. He said he'd contact an exterminator to come and take a look. By the next day, it stopped, and I thought the landlord must have taken care of it, even though I never saw the exterminator, nor got a notice there would be one coming around. But if he didn't have to enter the rooms, I guess that might have been why. The next day after that, the wife comes down for coffee. I should mention there are two apartments upstairs and two downstairs. Anyways, she comes down and we have coffee, and I tell her about the scratching in the ceiling. She said she hadn't heard anything, and she hasn't seen an exterminator either, but she's going to call the landlord later that day to tell him about sewer gases coming up the pipes, because her bathroom has a funny smell to it. Later that evening, I begin to smell something funny as well. So I call the landlord so he knows he needs to get a plumber to my place also and remind him about the exterminator. He says he'll get both out tomorrow to take care of the problems. That's another reason I live where I do. The landlord is always on top of things. The next morning, I wake up and there's an ambulance and police lights blaring through my windows. I run outside to see what's happening and I'm told it's nothing urgent and to go back inside and stay out of the way. As I'm going in, I see some men carrying out a stretcher with a sheet over it and an obvious body underneath. I was just praying it wasn't my friend's husband. 
later I found out it was the single man that lived upstairs. He was friends with the other man that lived downstairs. The man downstairs hadn't seen his friend in a few days and decided to go check on him. When the man didn't answer his door, he called emergency services. They found the upstairs man a few feet from his chair and dead. He had been dead for at least two days. The smell we had noticed was him decomposing. He had had a stroke in bed and tried to go get to the phone. Somewhere along the way he fell. I don't know how none of us heard him fall, but he was crawling to the chair to try and get himself up. He couldn't yell because of the stroke, and the scratching noises I had heard that I thought were mice were really him dragging himself across the wood floor above me. Ultimately, it wasn't the stroke that got him, but dehydration. When I call him an old man, that's compared to me in my 20s. He was only in his 60s and seemed pretty healthy. Always check on your older friends and neighbors, and encourage them to wear a life alert or something like that. It could really save their lives. Back around 2004-2005, I was leaving a buddy's house headed home. He lived on Lake Ariel in Wayne County. It was a good 15 miles away, so I decided to take back roads to save time and avoid cops. As I crest this mountain road, I see a van off to the side, doors open and lights on. It's well after midnight and no one is on the road. I slowed my car, a 1989 VW Ragtop, down to first gear, looking for a person or persons that may be hurt. Not a soul is around and the woods are quiet. The van off the road is not running, but all lights are on and the driver's door is open. I remember thinking, shit, I don't have cell service until the top of the mountain. I gotta call the cops. So I proceed to go towards where I knew I had cell service, maybe going 30 miles an hour tops. I knew this situation was weird, but then it got worse. No more than three or so miles away, the burst thinned on the roadside, so you had a better view of what's in the woods. I see movement, so I let off the gas, thinking I don't want to paste a deer. As I let off, this man, soaking in fresh blood, comes from the tree line and into the road. He's so covered in gore I couldn't tell it was a man at first. He stumbled out in front of the car and waved me down. I was in my rag top, top down of course. He was yelling and grabbing at my door. I dropped into first and took off. Another mile or so I had cell service and called the cops. Dude was obviously hurt, and his grab for my door scared me. There was a wide space on the mountain where I agreed to wait for the cops. They were there in under 10 minutes. While I waited, I put the top up, then locked the car doors. An officer took my statement, and he looked over my car with a torch. The guy from the woods left a bloody smear down my door. Another officer found the van, but couldn't locate the guy who came out of the woods. The cops let me go home, and said they'd call if they needed anything further. Within a few days, I get a call saying the van was located, and they asked if I could describe the man. They never found him that night, and as far as I know, they never did. Apparently, the van was stolen, and the cops surmised this guy banged himself up and took off in a panic. As far as I know, they never did track him down. And to this day, I keep a lookout for a bloody man running out of the woods. I was driving from Tombstone, Arizona, back up to Tucson. I had gone there to do some sightseeing and whatnot. I took the 82, then up the 83 to get onto I-10. It's a bit longer of a drive, but I hadn't been that way before and wanted to see it. It really didn't matter though, because it was getting dark when I left. And by the time I hit the Los Cinegas Conservation Area, it was already night. Driving along and not a car in sight, kind of getting tired actually, so I have my music blasting to keep me awake. Out of nowhere, this giant coyote jumps, not runs or walks, but jumps in front of my vehicle. 
This scares the living piss out of me and I swerve to avoid a collision. As I do, I see it jump out of the way of my car. I have never seen or heard of a coyote jumping, and this thing was big too. Think direwolf size from Game of Thrones, I shit you not. Okay, maybe a bit smaller. But it was much bigger than any coyote I've ever seen in real life or in pictures. The way it jumped didn't look natural either. It kind of sat on its back legs and jumped almost like it was on two feet. I didn't stop to get a second look at it. Seriously, I think that thing would have torn my car in half if I had. I sped up and made it home as soon as I could. I wouldn't say it was a dog man, because it didn't match any of those descriptions that I've heard. Not sure if it was a skinwalker or what it was. All I know is that it scared me. I live in a city now, but when I was a kid, I lived with my grandma in a very rural area of Florida that was known for being a dumping ground for murder victims. I never actually found a body while playing in the woods, but I did find a woman leaning over a creek in a dirty white dress at around 6 p.m., right as the sun was setting. I heard her faint sobbing in the distance and went to investigate. When I climbed over the embankment at the edge of the creek and finally saw her, she almost immediately started screaming at the top of her lungs, just staring into the water. Obviously, I wasn't a scaredy cat. I was a brave 12-year-old, so naturally, I instantly shit my pants and ran away. Still have no idea what that woman was doing, but that area was also known for having meth labs hidden in the woods. So that probably explains some of the strange people I met playing in that area. The place where I live, I don't know if you'd even call it a small town. It's more like a housing development in the middle of nowhere. There's a bunch of them all around too, and some proper small towns. It's three hours to anything resembling a city. I do most of my shopping on Amazon, and have the packages delivered to the post office a half hour away, if that gives you some idea of how remote this place is. In fact, I live on the outskirts of a housing development, and my nearest neighbor is a mile away. My backyard is all woods, and so is my front yard. It's a half mile to the road from my house. Despite the isolation, my wife and I love it here. There's usually some kind of get-together going on during the weekends in one of the small towns around, so that does give us a bit of socialization at least. There's also some weirdos we meet there as well. About six months ago, at the beginning of spring, one of the small towns had a show and shine. For those that don't know what that is, it's where car enthusiasts polish their show cars and then park them, usually on the main street, and people come and check out all the classic cars. We got there at 10 in the morning, and there was a pretty good crowd probably everyone doing what they can to get out of the house after winter and lockdown. I'd say 500 people easily were there, all looking at the sweet cars. Come noon and we go to the bar to get a drink and something to eat. Halfway through our meal and my wife tells me there's a guy across the room staring at her, and it's making her feel awkward. I take a look and he seems harmless enough. I tell her he's probably been cooped up and hasn't seen a pretty girl in a while. We finish our meal and head back out to look at some of the local artisans that set up booths to show their wares. Not even 20 minutes later, I notice the same guy from the bar on the other side of the street. When he sees that I noticed him, he ducks into one of the shops along the road. I see him one or two more times and finally tell my wife I'm going over there to talk to him. She tells me not to. She's tired and wants to go home, so we leave. A week later, it's nighttime, and my wife is getting out of the shower. I'm over in the den, and I hear her scream at the top of her lungs in terror. I run to her and find her on the floor with a towel wrapped around her. She looks absolutely terrified and white as a ghost. I'm kind of stunned to see her collapsed, and I take a second as my brain processes what could have caused her to be so frightened. 
she points to the window and blurts out, A man! There was a man outside! We have drapes on the windows, but we always forget to shut them. I mean, we're in the middle of the woods. Who are we afraid of looking into the house? Bigfoot? So anyone who was outside would have had a clear view of my wife getting out of the shower. Anyways, I grab a flashlight, my gun, and call my German Shepherd Dolly to come with me. I bust out the door, pissed as hell that someone would be snooping on my wife. Without even thinking, I let Dolly go. She's a trained attack dog my wife likes to have around for when I have to leave. And she bolts off around to the back of the house. I follow behind her. She stops at a tree and starts sniffing like mad for a few seconds, and then takes off deeper into the woods with a scent in her nose. There's an old service road about two miles behind my place that no one really uses anymore. It does connect to a main road, but driving down it is like a washboard and it's not kept up anymore. We get to this road and I see the taillights of a vehicle way down it, so I fire a shot into the air so they know that I saw them and mean business if they ever come back. For the next three months, everything is quiet. I leave the house for business one day, pretty much having forgotten about the incident, but my wife and Dolly are still home. I get a call later that Dolly is going absolutely insane. She's been by the back door, barking and snarling for a good 15 minutes. Naturally, this has my wife shook up. She looked out the window and couldn't see any deer or anything like that that might have made Dolly act up. I tell her to stay inside and I'll be back in a bit to check on things. When I get back, I go out and check around the house. I go out and do a spiral around our property to make sure everything is alright. The sheds look fine and I don't see anything suspicious until I'm 50 feet from the house. I find a raw steak by a tree and it has a pill pushed into the meat. The bastard was now trying to kill our dog. Nothing much else since then. Dolly has acted up once or twice, and I've found a dog toy or two that don't belong to us in our yard. Fortunately, we don't let Dolly out except for walks or if we're there with her. I actually own a part of the property all the way out to the service road, and I'm going to put a camera in the tree to try and get a license plate on this guy, and I'm going to put cameras around the house. I've bought a 9mm for the wife, which she is trained to use. I can't prove it's the same guy who followed us around six months ago at the car show, but I don't know who else it would be. I also have no idea how he found where we live or who he is. All I know is that when I find this guy, he's going to realize he picked the wrong couple to mess with. I live out in BFE, Kansas on a corn farm my dad owns. His house is about 50 acres across from mine. I work here and I'm learning how to run things with the expectation I'll take over someday. Lately, some strange things have been happening around the place. I'm not talking crop circles or anything like that. I'm talking about parts missing from the combines. Our shop has been broken into. We have a couple of farmhands that have seen cars speeding off from the equipment left out in the back 40, but we've never been able to get a license plate or anything. We've made police reports, but there are so few sheriffs and our county is so big that they can't really watch the place all the time. We've put up security equipment around the shops and whatnot, but there was one place we didn't think they'd try to steal from. My house is the furthest from the road, so I never would have thought they would have come here. But a month ago, I was laying in bed with my wife, about to go to sleep. She bolted upright all of a sudden, and said she had heard something. I hadn't heard anything and told her so, and to go back to bed. She listened for a while, and then thought it was nothing and laid back down. Next thing I know, I'm hearing something. It sounded like someone was trying to turn our doorknob. We live in a two-story house, and the master bedroom is right up the stairs from the door so it's pretty much a straight shot from the door to the bedroom. I say, Honey, you hear that? And she says, Yeah, that's what I heard earlier. I tell her to stay put and get on my robe and grab my shotgun. 
I load it with some slugs because we don't have kids yet, and I'm not really worried about shooting through a wall and hitting something. I get to the top of the stairs, and we have glass on either side of the door. I see a silhouette behind the glass, so I know someone is there. I don't shoot yet, because I never shoot until I positively ID my target. I wait silently. My heart is beating out of my chest, and my mouth is dry. The door pops open and a head comes through, covered in a ski mask. Really, I thought the ski mask thing was only in movies, but there it was. I know no one related to me or associated with me would be picking my lock in the middle of the night wearing a ski mask. So I yell stop and let a round fly over their heads, punching a hole through my door. My wife lets out a scream. Through the hole in my door, I can see two guys running up the driveway. They jump into an old Lincoln Continental and peel out of there. I call the police, but they don't get here anywhere near in time to catch the guys. I give them a description of the car as best I could, and they're still looking for them. Whoever they were, I'm sure I scared them off. Glad they didn't try to break into my dad's house. They were probably worried they could have been seen from the road, so they came to mine. My dad would have slept through the whole thing if they had gone there. I just hope he would have been able to wake up the next morning. We put a gate at the front of the driveway. Floodlights are up around the houses, as well as cameras. I'm reasonably sure we've seen the last of them. It's more to deter anyone else from getting any ideas. This happened before everyone had cell phones or GPS. It was 1995 and I was a young college student. It was the start of the school year and I was a sophomore at Duke University. My family wasn't that well off and I had gotten in on a scholarship. Anyways, I was from Cleveland, Ohio and had to make my way back to start school. Someone had told me there was a shorter route than taking I-70 to I-40. I was to take some old highways. I don't remember exactly which ones, it was so long ago, but if I took them, it would save me over an hour or two. They showed me on the map and it seemed to make sense at the time. If I could even get a couple more hours with my family, it was worth it. I left later than I normally would have, counting on saving a couple of those hours, and made my way to Durham. I got so lost on those back roads, I was running much later than I normally would have. I had a good memory back then, and failed to write down the directions, or even mark it on my map before I left. Stupid early 20s college kid, thought he knew everything, and pulled into some backwater town right before the sun went down with some car problems. It turns out I had a bad alternator, but I didn't know that at the time. I was driving an old 80s Datsun I'd picked up from my uncle for a few hundred bucks. Got into town and everything is shut down except the bar. This place didn't even have a hotel I could stay at for the night. The gas station and automotive shop didn't open until 8 the next morning. I suppose they didn't get many travelers through there since most people would have taken the interstate. Grabbed a bite to eat at the bar and then went back to my car to sleep. Now driving a Datsun isn't comfortable at all. You can't even imagine what it's like for a taller guy like myself to try and sleep in one. But try I did. Two in the morning and the bars are starting to empty. I wake up to people hooting and hollering as they leave the place. I roll over trying to go back to sleep when a couple slams against the hood of my car. It looked like the guy thought he was going to get lucky right then and there, but the girl had different ideas. She said he's drunk and to get off her. He kept pushing, begging to go further. It was embarrassing, really, and disgusting. This kept going on, and he would not take no for an answer. Finally, I crawled over and got out of the passenger side, mainly because they were pretty much all over the driver's side exit. I told him to get off the car and to go away. He looked at me and staggered about for a second, before giving me the middle finger. The girl had now moved behind him, and he seemed to have forgotten about her. She took a few steps back and then hurried out of there. The guy turned to call her back, but I said he should just go home. Well, that sent him on to me again. He looked at me and slurred out, You know, I don't like you. 
I suddenly realized the situation I was in. I was in an unknown town with no way out, no friends to call or help to get. He turned around and then called out, Hey guys, let's fuck this dude up. But no one was left at the bar or in the street. He staggered a bit until it sunk in he had no backup. He turned back around and pointed his finger at me saying, You're lucky. Tonight's your lucky night, shithead. Then he slowly walked over to a truck on a side street and got in. I stood there and waited for 5-10 to ten minutes and the truck didn't go anywhere. So I went and looked inside to find him passed out in the front seat. I figured he'd wake up with a pounding headache and a fuzzy memory with how drunk he was. So I go back to my car, lock the doors and go back to sleep. The next morning when I wake up his truck is gone. I go get my car fixed and then get some breakfast. The waitress was the girl from the night before. She thanked me and gave me some free pancakes. I left her as big of a tip as I could and then headed out of town. I ended up getting to Duke later that day. Not incredibly scary, but it could have been much worse. At the time, I was pretty scared because I was all alone in the middle of nowhere. If he had friends around, who knows how it would have gone down. They might have taken him away and apologized. Or I could have ended up in the hospital. You never really know. I'm so glad we have GPS now to show lengths of trips and fastest routes. It was much different when I was younger, and easier to get lost. I grew up in a podunk town. If you've ever seen the first Tremors, that was roughly the size of it. One store that was also the gas station, the post office, and a beer bar, on top of selling a little bit of everything you'd need. Stayed there until I was 25 and now live in another small town, albeit bigger at least. This happened when I was 13. A stranger pulled into town with car troubles. He took it to the closest thing we had to a shop, which was just Mr. Benson's garage where he ran a small business, keeping everyone's vehicles in town working and also fixed tractors and other equipment. This guy was at the store getting something to eat. And of course I was there too, because there was nowhere else for a kid to be in that town. As soon as I saw him, he gave me the creeps. He was very skinny and had huge bags under his eyes. His teeth were yellow and he had long greasy black hair. Looking at him made my skin crawl. I remember Mr. Bartlett, the shop owner, was trying to make conversation with the guy. The usual where you from and where you headed, but the man didn't say much. When Mr. Bartlett would look away tending to the shop, the man would turn to me and smile, and once he even winked at me. After the wink is when I got sick to my stomach, so I left to go mess around with my bike down the road. A couple of hours pass and I've got a makeshift jump built that I'm riding over to see how high I can get. When the man passes by, his car obviously fixed by now and he's heading out of town. He sees me and stops to ask me directions to some other town. I didn't clue in why he wouldn't have asked an adult in town, and despite the nausea I felt from his appearance, I decided to tell him so he would leave. He kept saying he couldn't hear me so I would get closer to talk to him. When I was about two feet away, he pushed his car door open, knocking me off my bike. We weren't that far from the store, maybe 20 or so feet, and Mr. Bartlett had come out to throw away some trash. He sees the man hit me with his car door and starts yelling at the guy. The guy was already out of his vehicle standing over me, but here's Mr. Bartlett. He looks at me, then at Mr. Bartlett, then at me again. Mr. Bartlett is already running down the street shouting at him. The man then decides it's better to make a getaway than to get into a fight, so he hops back into his car and takes off. I scurried out of the way so not to get run over, because the man swerved right at me running over my bike. I was fine, but scared out of my mind. Mr. Bartlett called the police and gave a description of the vehicle. He was picked up by the sheriff a few towns over. This was way back in the late 90s, so I forget how long of a sentence the man got. It's not something I like to think about. There was a bunch of weird stuff in his car. 
fetish magazines, duct tape, and some other stuff. The guy was very sick. I'm so thankful Mr. Bartlett was taking out the trash at that time. If the man had gotten me in his car, I don't like to think about how things would have turned out. I probably wouldn't be here today.